Thanks to everybody for showing up uh, early. Um, so this is the second half of this, uh, this talk. And as you remember yesterday, I talked about using plasmonics in energy applications uh, like solar cells and these sort of things. Uh, with a uh, conclusion uh, that in uh, most cases uh, it doesn't really help that much, but there are some tantalizing possibilities that we can explore. Um, at the end, I also told you a little bit about quantum dot solar cells and uh, other quantum dot applications. And what I uh, showed you is that many of these quantum dots have defects on them that cause them to blink in their fluorescence and cause them to blink in their current. Um, now, what I didn't tell you is that that is a really bad property of these uh, materials to have if you put them in a solar cell. So they have an intrinsic defect, and this is actually limiting the performance of these solar cells. Um, and so what I'm going to show you is uh, one possible way to deal with that problem uh, and to turn off this blinking effect. And one way that we've been playing with, and this is a lot of research that I did with uh, Ivan uh, together and his uh, grad students, um, is that we've been playing with using liquid crystal systems to manipulate these quantum dots uh, and, and plasmonic particles. And here is an example of that where uh, what we did is this, this uh, beautiful uh, topological defect that forms naturally in these chiral um, liquid crystal systems. And these things have these point defects that attract, because uh, they want to minimize their elastic energy, they attract these uh, particles in them. And so we demonstrated these, these systems. You can see there, the, the, here is a gold nanoparticle schematically sketched in that, in that defect. And you can use these things because they, se they can self-organize in, uh, in strings and in other, or, uh, in other arrays. And you can use these to actually make these arrangements of plasmonic particles in this case. And here are the actual experimental uh, arrangements that uh, we realized. Uh, even nicer is that you can switch these sort of things by uh, applying a voltage to your liquid crystal and they, the, you get difference in orientation and in strain and these sort of things. And you can use that to basically uh, manipulate. Let me turn that off manipulate uh, and form different structures based on the voltage. And so here is an example of uh, arrays being formed with these liquid crystal defects all spontaneously. And by switching the voltage, you can change that from this, from this sort of almost hexagonal arrangement into strings and other, other arrangements. Um, and so the idea came, well, can we maybe use these sort of uh, um, principles to direct plasmonic particles? direct them near to quantum emitters like a, like, like a semiconductor quantum dot or um, something like a, a single dye molecule or uh, uh, something similar to that and actually uh, control the emission of these, uh, of these single emitters. So here's the experimental concept. Um, so here is a schematically sketched one of those defects that sits between the two plates that, uh, that encase the, uh, the, uh, the liquid crystal over there. And uh, these, these are schematic arrangements of the little rods that make up the liquid crystal, and they form this uh, very uh, complex structure. But that complex structure has two traps in it. And in one of those traps, uh, we'll put this quantum dot in a rod, and uh, that's just because the, the rod is a little longer and it gets trapped easier in one of those defects, but the emitter is really this cat selenite uh, dot that sits inside there. Uh, put that in one of those uh, traps and then take a plasmonic particle, in this case a nanoburst, and get that near and this will get attracted and hopefully uh, end up in the same uh, trap as the, as the other, um, as the quantum rod. And so these plasmonic particles, they're quite complex and, and they're chosen basically because they have such enormous enhancements. And here is a calculation of uh, basically one of those particles in it that we took in the TEM and then do the, do the field calculation. And you get uh, uh, many, many orders of magnitude enhancement uh, in these sort of areas around, around the, this structure. 
So here is an example of, of taking that nanoburst particle. There's a, there's a, the, these traps here, and this is an optical uh, microscope image, and they scatter light, which causes that ring to show up. Uh, and this is a, the, the nanoburst particle over there, and we'll, we'll use laser traps uh, to get that near and drop it in. And so this is a little movie, actually, and you can see it happening. Uh, so it's the laser, the, the laser trap is picking it up, putting it near, and then releasing it, and it naturally uh, flies into the, into the trap over there. And that, that flashing that you see to lighter and brighter is the turning on and off of the, of the, of the trapping beam. So here, from, the, from those sort of trajectories, when you see that, that particle drop in, you can uh, calculate uh, the speed that it has. You can calculate basically the elastic energy of the trap and, and how much it traps. This is the, the potential in uh, KT. And you can see one KT is about 40 nanometers out. So these things are highly localized inside that, uh, that uh, defect. So here is a, uh, basically in, in, in a microscope, just looking at uh, two of these, two of these uh, defects that have a quantum, quantum dot in a, in a rod in it. Uh, this is before we add the, 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 nano, the nanoburst plasmonic particle. And you can see, if you look carefully, you can see it blinking. Uh, and here after, we dropped a nanoburst in this one. And you can see it's brighter, and it stopped blinking. Uh, and of course, it's noisy, this image, because it's a, in an optical microscope with, a, with just a lamp uh, uh, ex exciting, the, exciting the system. It's a little bit easier to see if you just time average that, that, that's, that same image. And again, this ring over here is just scattering off the, uh, off the, uh, off the, the liquid crystal defect. Inside here is the, is the actual quantum dot that's emitting, so that's that little peak over here. And after you put in you put in the nanoburst, you can see uh, it's brighter. Uh, it's like a factor of two, three brighter or so than it's uh, than it was before. Now, if you actually look at the blinking of the particle, and so this is the time trace in seconds over here of of these particles in that defect. And what you can see is that uh, the particle is mostly in its off state over here and uh, then in its on state. So this is before we drop the nanoburst particle in. And after we put the nanoburst particle in, what you get is that the particle is, mo is mostly in the on state now suddenly. Now that on state is not significantly brighter than uh, it was before. It's just that it's more in the on state. Same thing if you actually look at the, look at traces like this, and uh, Paul, uh, the student uh, who did most of his work, and Aridas also was involved with that. Um, uh, they collected many traces and did the, the 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 this sort of typical thresholding analysis. So basically, you you define in uh, you define a threshold between where you say it's on and where and where it's off, and then you look at how long is is it in the on state, how long is it is it in the off state. And what you get is these power laws uh, type distributions of on and off times. And uh, this is before the nanoburst is dropped in, and you get similar distributions uh, of on and off. But then when you actually put the, 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 nano, the, sorry, the nanoburst plasmonic particle in it, uh, what you get is that the particle is much more likely to be in the on state, and that longer on states are more prevalent. But the other thing that you see is that you don't really see a change in these power laws. Uh, they look basically the same. It's just that, uh, that it, the particle is more likely to be in the on state. Um, then, uh, because we got some comments from reviewers and that sort of thing, that uh, uh, you have to look at this with uh, not just thresholding, but there is another way of looking at data like that, which is called change point analysis. So there's a method that was in the literature uh, just, just recently. And if you actually uh, look at quantum dots uh, using that me method, you don't get power law distributions, but you get exponential distributions. 
so we also looked at the, the, the behavior of our quantum dots uh, using that same method. And this is a method based, based on Bayesian analysis and these sort of things. And so it's, uh, it's quite an involved method to, to apply to your data, but we did that. And what you get is these sort of distributions that are more exponential-like in, in this double-double log plot. And so this is before the plasmonic particle is present. You can see the, that they, the on and off state are sort of similar in this case for this partic specific particle. Um, but then when you put the plasmonic particle near it, what you get is uh, more prevalent long on states uh, according to the change point analysis. So the, the result is, uh, is apparently robust. We get, uh, uh, wh however way you analyze your data, you get particles that are in, in their on state much, uh, much more often and longer. Then if you uh, with time correlated single photo counting, you look at uh, particles, and here's four different ones with different uh, quantum rods uh, and different uh, nanobursts uh, dropped into them. And uh, what we see, if you look at the free quantum rod just floating around in the liquid crystal, uh, you get a very long lifetime, so tens of nanoseconds in this case. Uh, and then when you put that on just on glass, you get a slight shortening of the lifetime. This is, this is well known that they all do that. But when you put the plasmonic particle in it, you get um, about an order of magnitude decrease of the fluorescence lifetime of these uh, particles. So they're much faster. Um, and it's reproducible over many particles here. That it reproduces so well was actually a little bit of a surprise to me because you saw that those nanobursts are not very well defined in their plasmonic, uh, in their field enhancement around it. Uh, but we get very similar enhancements in every case. Now, of course, we have already seen that yesterday. You can basically say, well, this is probably a Purcell effect enhancement. You enhance the emission rate. And similar things have been seen for quantum dots in photonic crystals, like, uh, like this paper here that uh, was 2004. They uh, used these photonic crystals and different spacings of the lattice in this photonic crystal, and you can basically change the lifetime of a quantum dot that's in there uh, by this effect. Similarly, uh, and this is a beautiful paper from Jennifer Hollingsworth, um, where uh, they built these fantastic structures with, uh, with core shells, with uh, a gold shell around them, and variable dielectric spacings over there. And you can manipulate the lifetime of these, uh, of these uh, systems uh, very well this way. And we also saw some of this yesterday already uh, from uh, a previous speaker. And this is uh, where they took these nano nanocubes and basically wedged a little quantum dot underneath that, and you see very strong enhancements of the, uh, of the lifetime. Uh, so so very, uh, very much faster lifetimes when, when you do this. Uh, and this is very, very similar sort of, uh, sort of enhancements, actually, about a factor of 10. Uh, and a, an increase in the actual intensity that's coming out that seems to be due to mo mostly a preferential beaming of the, of the light towards the objective. Um, there is a, another comparable result that uh, was in the literature a little while ago. And this raises a question, actually. Uh, here, what, uh, what they did, uh, so Lucas Novotny uh, did, did this, and uh, over here, uh, Lee uh, did a very similar experiment. So Lucas actually took a AFM tip and put a gold nano, nanosphere at the end of the, of the tip. And the nice thing about this is that you can then move it closer and closer to your quantum dot, which is on the, on the substrate. The, it's drawn over here by like this little dot, and vary that spacing. And what they see is indeed that they can stop the blinking from occurring. But how they explained it is actually very, a very different explanation, which is that you get radiative uh, uh, transfer from the quantum dot to the, to the plasmonic particle over there, which then quenches the luminescence of the quantum dot. And instead of radiative uh, lifetime changes, they say that it's dominated by non-radiative rate uh, changes. Um, 
And a similar thing happens in this paper where they took a gold uh, particle which they push with an AFM towards the quantum dot. And they see a similar change in lifetime, but here they also explain this by, by changes in the, uh, the non-radiative rate. Uh, now, we don't see any changes in the intensity. You can see exactly over here, you can see that happening, is that uh, th this is the, the same sort of experiment with the, with the blinking dot, and it stops blinking, but its intensity is much lower. Uh, and that's a very different uh, type of result as what we saw. We don't see any changes in the intensity. And uh, we, uh, in the on intensity of the on state, uh, like you see here, when you go closer and closer, the, that on state just disappears uh, and it's much lower intensity, but it doesn't blink uh, as much anymore. Uh, so we, I think we, are, we have really to do with a, uh, with not with a non-radiative rate uh, change, but with an actual per cell enhancement in our case. And the reason here being is that uh, they go, they take that gold uh, dot far closer to the quantum dot than we take our nanoburst particle. And the reason why that is, and I should have included a figure of this, is that these nanoburst particles, when they're inside the, the liquid crystal, they form a line defect that traces the, out, the outline of that particle that sits about 10 nanometers from the surface of that, uh, of that nanoburst particle. That line defect is actually what will then trap the quantum, the quantum rod and keep it at that constant distance from that surface. And in this experiment, they go, uh, to uh, uh, sub-nanometer distances to see that quenching. And so we never get close enough to actually see uh, any actual quenching of the luminescence of the quantum dot. Um, so you can think about a very simple model of what, what is actually happening. Uh, and I oversimplified it quite a bit over here. Um, so you have your dot in the ground state, photon comes in, it's excited and it can uh, emit light, and so this is what you want to happen, so because then, then you get light, light coming out of this thing, but it can also uh, trap one of the charges, whether this happens by uh, Auger ionization or other processes, uh, doesn't really matter that much, but that leads to a charged dot that is now dark, that won't emit any light anymore, and so you have to wait until that uh, trap empties its carrier out of it before you can get light out of it again. Uh, now, if you take a scheme like this, so you just have a rate for trapping and a rate for detrapping uh, back to the ground state, if you increase the rate of this fluorescence, then it doesn't have as much chance anymore to get to that, to that charge state that makes it dark. So, uh, if you, by Purcell effect, enhance the radiative rate, the dot will stay in its own state longer and is much less likely to end up charged and much less likely to, uh, to become dark. Uh, are some alternative mechanisms that, that might lead to this, which is basically would lead to, to, uh, to this sort of uh, uh, fluorescence quenching, in which you get, you get ionization followed by tr transfer over to the, to the plasmonic particle, just tunneling over. Uh, which then allows you to recombine on the, uh, on, the, on the metal particle that's nearby. This would quench the, the fluorescence. And this is a similar mechanism to normal fluorescence quenching. Uh, this is not consistent with our results, but, so, uh, but it was posed as an alternative uh, uh, that, we, that we had to eliminate. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some ongoing experiments since we're getting uh, close to the end, and I realize I have talked much faster than I meant to, but uh, that's all right. Um, so to better control this, and I uh, showed you these, these nanoburst particles, which are very complex. The nice thing about them is that they're very easy to move around in the liquid crystal with a laser trapping system, and that's why we really use them. Um, so what, right now we've been playing with these systems where we have nanorods like this, gold nanorods, and here is uh, sort of a schematic of these things in a line defect, also in a liquid crystal. And the cool thing about this is that you can, uh, li like is shown in this, in this video here, you can push one of those nanorods closer to the other, 
and squeeze a quantum dot in between, basically, like you can see over here. And now when they get close, they start, they start pushing each other away once in a while and that sort of thing. But there, is my, there might be time to actually get an arrangement <coughs> like this and have a very well-defined uh, cavity over there that uh, allows you to, to study that, that single particle over there. And this is again, this is a line defect with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, gold nanorods in it. And I think there's just a little uh, conclusions there. Uh, so we, on a single nanoparticle, and this is really the strength of what we did, is that we were able to take a single nanorod and use the exact same nanorod and, and bring a plasmonic system close by and study the effect on the, on the emission from that single, uh, single quantum system. Uh, the exact same one and what we see is reduction of blinking and much faster luminescence and that's, like, that's due to the Purcell effect increasing the radiative rate which uh, allows the particle to be in its own state much more often and longer. Um, and what I didn't talk about but the reason why, this is, why these sort of things are maybe interesting is that these sort of effects you can use them to increase the radiative efficiency of quantum dots of course which is interesting for lighting type applications uh, but is also interesting perhaps for uh, solar systems and these sort of things where you don't want that trapping to occur uh, but where uh, you want the the, uh, all the emission to be radiative instead of non-radiative because that increases your efficiency of your solar system. And with that, there's a whole list of people involved with all different part of this, uh, part of this research. Um, with that, I just want to thank you for your attention and actually showing up early. And I think we have some time for questions.